I hope I'm broadcasting. Um, okay, so today, uh, as we mentioned last time, we're going to be talking, talking about information, just bringing up some of the issues that inevitably have to be discussed for a class called the History of Information. And I'm going to take up two topics that clearly have a historical aspect, and they're terms that we know pretty well. So it's the notion of the age of information, that this is the age of information, and also the notion of an information revolution. And we want to kind of put that into historical perspective. So this is more or less where I'm going to go if I get to the end. It'll be a triumph. Just talk about this notion, the age of information, and say, well, we know that phrase. It's a kind of banal phrase now, but, but what is in that notion of an age, an age of X? Kind of where does it come from, and how do we think about it? Why does it seem important in society? And as we look then at a series of ages, there's the industrial age or the agricultural age. Then there comes the question, well, how do we move from one to another? And how significant is that? And what are the driving forces? And this will become a big question next week when we talk about information determinism, um, because that says that, or technology determinism, because that says it's technology that drives us through these gaps. Then, taking one of the answers to how we get from it, we'll talk about revolution in particular, because that's the phrase that's usually thrown around, the information revolution. So what's, what's involved in talking about revolution? That'll form most of the class, in fact, to look at different ideas of revolution. Then at the end, I want to come back to the notion as well, why is history important in making this argument? I think Jeff discussed last time. I'll discuss again next time. But before we get into that, let me this is going to work. Yep, get to the assignment. So we gave you an assignment last time which said pick one of the following and explain how it might serve as an information technology. The question was, or the issue that Jeff brought up was can we really identify what is an information technology? At first it seems dead easy. They're machines like that. They're, they're Apple computers or they're um, digital te uh, the portable telephones, mobiles, whatever. They're, but then when you say look around, it actually becomes hard to say, well, what isn't an information technology in one way or another? And that's why we produce this list that at first view looks kind of absurd. But as you all found out, I think all those who did the assignment, as you go through it, each of them can in certain circumstances plausibly be thought of as an information technology. This is kind of how you stacked up. The bicycle may be because it was the first one on the list got the most hits of all and most people now. Whether they thought it was the most challenging or the least challenging, I don't know. We'll come back to it. The necktie did pretty well with nine. The blanket got eight. The piece of string got 12. And the dish rack, which was clearly a battle for some, but some people were willing to take it on, got five. So, but in some ways, everybody felt they could find somewhere in here an information technology. So let me just pick up a few and see what, what people said. There, some of the answers were good. Olivia, is Olivia Chang here? Yeah, Olivia, are you willing to tell us what you said? Oh, so, um, basically, I was assuming that we can use a bicycle as a prototype for a possible cars in the future. And then, like, because of like, a possible car, right, like, right. For, like, future generations. Yep, okay. Okay. Because, like, So we'll all be peddling our cars. The assumption there is that a car then is an information technology. Is that kind of yeah? Okay. There's a little bit at the end, yeah. So what was that? So we'd all go to the gym. I mean, if the lights got dim, we'd all have to rush out and start pedaling somewhere down in, 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 in Hearst, and then we could come back again. And then that's an assumption that a generator, too, is a kind of information technology. Was it all? OK, so that's another idea that it brings up. It makes other information technologies possible by providing power for them. So those, those are two notions. Many people got the idea that, for instance, the bicycle is used, has been long been used to deliver newspapers. Before that, it was used to deliver the mail, the, the, the mail bicycle. So it, quite a lot of ways in which, Syed, Syed here? 
Yeah, are you willing to tell us what you said? Okay, so two things to say. I'll repeat that just so it gets on tape. But it says one is that, and this is true of so much, you know, it carries a lot of symbols on it. There are labels all over it. And in that case, it's carrying around and doing a lot of work for the manufacturer by advertising the product all around town. So that's one. Um, but the, the, the second one is that if you look at a bicycle, if you look at my bicycle in particular, you can see here's a guy who's a real cheapskate because it's ancient and battered and he hasn't looked after it very well. I, 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 worked in, I taught in Denmark for a while. Denmark's amazing. It has the rustiest chains in the world. It's really impressive. It's a society which is deeply resistant to buying oil at any time in its life. But as I said, you can sort of tell something about the individual or the collective by looking at the bike. So there you are again. By the way, um, I, I'll call you out. If I mispronounce your name, do excuse me. The, the, the great thing that I can say is nobody knows how to pronounce my name, so we're on equal turf. Um, but but I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. Okay, so that was the bicycle. Um, the necktie was an interesting one. Um, Victoria. Hey, Victoria, so what did you have to say? So I basically said that the necktie can be used as a, a way of conveying that the person wearing it has a certain role in the So as soon as I read that homework, I had to go home and find a tie to put on because clearly there was, there was a take off my t-shirt. Yeah. Uh, and, okay, so that's a good point. Again, there's a kind of semiotics of fashion. Um, one other reason that I wore this, in fact, is it's much more true of England and fading there now, now, but some of you will have heard of the concept of the old school tie. Um, and that's a notion that you can kind of signal where you went to school and other people will know, and this in fact is, though it hasn't been worn for 30 years, I dug it out of a drawer, my old school tie. And in certain circles, though it's changed now, it indicates things, it indicates my class background in England, where class background is still very significant. It indicates my religious background, because I went to a religious school. So these things are just flung away by the tie as soon as you kind of walk out into the street, and that's one reason why I left England 30 years ago. Um, <laughs> Kelly, Kelly, yeah, what did you have? You had an interesting thing on the tie, too. Um, I said that the necktie can be information about a person's social status as well as their fashion preference. Mm -hmm. And that can vary on context. For instance, a man in his business suit in his office wearing a tie trying to briefcase uh, signifies power and a sense of professionalism. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, I think it's a very nice analysis. Again, not only does it signal things, but it signals different things about different people, and that you get a different kind of, you know, a woman wearing a tie is sending a different message, either a very sophisticated one, or that she might be a rather naive person, whereas a man wearing it has also... I mean, one intriguing thing for me today is the first time I think I've ever walked across campus wearing a tie, and people give you very nervous looks. I, I think the first impression most people seem to have was that I was going to try and sell them a Bible. But uh, there was, there's definitely a, a notion that, that you don't see a lot of these around the Berkeley campus. Um, so it was an experience for me, too. Okay, the blanket. Ariane? Ariana? You here? Yeah. But you had a little more than that. I mean, you, you, you had a nice example of how it might. or at least would like you to think that they were intellectuals. Yeah, okay, so we have things like blankets and the writing on them. Not can just simply tell you, as some said, that you, know, you go to Cal and have a blanket with Cal written on it, but maybe slightly coded social signals about your status, you know, the intellectual pretensions of the parents. Probably not the baby yet, but, it, but at some point. Uh, okay, and then a um, piece of string. Uh, quite a lot of people took this on, which is an interesting example. Charles, 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 is he here? 
No, oh, yeah, actually, I had a nice example, which will come back in linguistics, so we'll, we'll refer to that again. And Diana? Uh, yeah. So if you think of a book as an information technology, then clearly the string that holds it together. And Diane makes a nice point, which we'll come back to again when we're looking at books and different kinds of binding. Um, the Chinese who didn't have the, for a long time, didn't use the standard European binding, had things like butterfly binding and other kinds of binding which had the more string. But even your know, European binding has, uh, the old books are sewn with thread and the thread or string is, is, is in the back and in the side. So it's a nice point about the way that a technology is made up of many parts, and in this case, by string, and indeed, in different societies, that string has different significance. I mean, it used to be here that if you went to a good old second-hand bookshop, they would always, if you bought five or six books, they would tie them beautifully in string. Not really anymore. Uh, and finally, the least popular, but in some ways the most challenging, was the dish rack. Um, Anne. Anne, are you here? Yeah, tell, tell us what you said about the dish rack. Okay, so then an, a nice example both of the, how the rack can be a kind of part of a semiotic system and also how we, in fact, read the world in this way quite a lot. Even without being conscious of it, we can go into a house and kind of get an interesting feeling or a shudder and it's because perhaps the dish rack is just filthy and they're about to give us a meal. <laughs> we think, oh my God, you know, maybe it's time to leave. And we play, and, and many of you, I think, will have this if you've actually you know, gone to live in a, a, a shared dorm room or an apartment together, that people have pretty different ideas about what's clean and dirty and what goes in the rack and what doesn't, because we all have a slightly different system, but use items like this as the signifying factor. Okay, so the homeworks that came in, they were nice. I think a lot of you had sort of put some thought into it and kind of taken it as a challenge to say, you know, let's try, to try and take the hardest thing and say something interesting about it. So thank you for that. Okay, so let me now get then into the, the bulk of the class. The question of the age of information. Um, let me begin by sort of saying, by playing you, if I can, um, if I can, he said, if I haven't lost my mouse, okay, um, a kind of standard, you know, take on, you will recognize the city, I won't play at all.
Okay, you sort of get the point. <laughs> it, it, uh, it, it, it go, goes on a little while, but, but I guess we get the point. It's the age of information. You can see it's also the age of the San Francisco fog, the poor guy trying to film and everything floating around. Um, okay, I mean, it, so it's a kind of, I don't want to be unkind, it's a little b, it's, it's a platitude, um, uh, but it's something that we kind of just accept. You know, why not write a song about it? Why not rap about it? Because we all know that it's the case. One thing which I'll, I'll come back to later, though, that is interesting about it, he says it's the age of information, but he actually makes a couple of points. We didn't get to them all. Um, but he says, you know, it's the age of information, but the age of information is hell. And that's a kind of pause, because we tended to think, no, the age of information is this great thing. And he says, I feel the human race has not progressed as much as we should be. How come it isn't progressing as fast as technology? Yeah, we're going to be staying on the moon, but there's still going to be racists. So part of his argument is, OK, well, it is. He's not saying it's not the age of information. He's saying it is the age of information, but it isn't having much effect on my life. Things don't seem to be changing. And of course, one of the assumptions when we say that this is an age is we say this it is an age and we've moved into a whole new sphere of the world. So I'll come back to that topic. But um, if, we, if, we, if we take his, his idea, this is the age of information, more or less, you know, four or five years, when did it begin? No? 1970s? 1970s? Because? It's not quite. I mean, yeah, we're getting towards the personal computer. I mean, the, 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 the Mac and the IBM uh, personal computer a little later, but more or less, yeah. So 1970s, would we more or less go along with that? Anyone want to put an earlier bit or a later bit? Sorry, I should ask, well, what's your name? Because I... I, I uh, Pauline, okay, I'll forget it again, but it's good to keep trying. Yeah. And sorry, you are? I'm Aaron. Aaron, okay. We've had ways of storing information for a long time. I think the internet is the breakthrough because it allows us to communicate information in ways like never before. So the, the internet, then, not so much the computer, does that change the dating? I don't know. <laughs> Are we going to put a date on the internet? The 1990s. Well, the World Wide Web is the 1990s. Is in fact, it, yeah, sorry, and you are? Uh, Allison. Allison? But to Lil B. But, yeah. yeah, all right, OK. <laughs> He's our man. He's our measure. Uh -huh. sure. So we're just getting into the, in the age of information. OK, yeah. OK. I mean, there were older systems, there was the wide area, wide area information system and Veronica. But yeah, yeah, I mean, OK, so then you're putting it with Google or AltaVista and Google, so maybe mid-90s. So we've gone from the 70s, mid-90s. In some suggestion, we're not quite there yet, because Lil B is still looking around San Francisco for his PC. But, but, but more or less, yeah. So, okay, you're, you're raising the bidding here. So you're going to put a date more or less on that? No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, a millennium, even? You want to put a millennium? Okay, but so when books got out of the monasteries, and that's something we'll talk about when we get to talk about manuscript and printing. Okay, so we've got a range. There's a kind of fine cluster from the 70s until the present, and then occasionally people come along and say, well, hang on. You know, there have been big changes before that involved information. Um, this is uh, an ad, hard to see, I'm afraid, in, in this light from July 1977, the IBM, an IBM ad in Fortune saying information, there's growing agreement, it's the name of the age that we live in. And once, and, and, and it's kind of interesting in the, in the same issue of Fortune, I didn't, I didn't uh, take a photograph of it, but there's actually um, a, a, a breakdown of gross national product and there's no information sector there at all. It's still a very old fashioned, but still. So certainly there was some feeling there um, that we're already breaking through to an information age then. At least we're starting, as some people say, to think of ourselves as living in an information age, which is pretty good and would, be, would hold up well, except that this tremendous old chap, Vicesimus Knox, in an essay he wrote in 1778, said, 
little echoing what we've just heard, but though books are easily procured, yet even in this age of information, he says, um, there are thousands in the lower classes that cannot read. So he's speaking for Lil B, again, in many ways. He's answering what Allison said here, is that, well, he's saying there's lots of books, but they're actually not getting across the social structure. Yeah? Well, that's another question. Do, does each age think of, and we'll actually come, if we, get, if we get there, we'll come to that. This question is, well, is there only one age of information, or are there multiple ages of each information, each one slightly differing one from the other? So then we want to say to little B, well, it isn't the age of information, it's this age of information. Sorry, and you, you were? Ramos. Ramos pulls out. Okay, so, so that's, uh, so, um, and then there's another way in which someone like Anthony Ottinger will say, echoing that point, Every, every age and every organization is an information organization. Every society, sorry. And every, so every society is an information one. And that argument, in fact, is made to some degree by this chap Floridi, a philosopher of information, who said, history depends on the development of systems to record events and hence accumulate and transmit information about the past. If we don't have a recording system, as people said, it's all about storage. We don't have an information system. So, no records, no history. So, for those doing history of information, history is actually synonymous with the information age. The minute you have written history, you've got an information age. Since prehistory is that age in human development that precedes the availability of recording systems. So as long as you have a recording system, and that's what in some ways we're covering in this course, from, cage paint, uh, from, from cave painting in Lascaux to the present, you have an information age. Again, there's always somebody ready to put up the bidding. Here we have primitive man looking around in the world and seeing information and getting an idea about how to capture rabbits, inventing agriculture and calling it wisdom. So the tricky thing is you can kind of project wisdom on all ages. So then the question becomes, OK, well, kind of what is in an age then? Um, the uh, the ad that we had, although you couldn't see it very well, from uh, IBM, this is a little bit of it in the top left-hand corner, human history has long been described in terms of ages. So not always as an information age, but he does want to say we like to think that we can segment time in these different ways and say each age has a character. So there's been a Stone Age and a Bronze Age and an Iron Age and so on. And IBM is kind of hoping we're going to call this the IBM age, you know, by the time its ad is picked up. So we can see, and you're all familiar, I'm sure, with different ways of thinking about this. The one that IBM catches on is the stone, iron, bronze, agricultural, and industrial age. All right, and those are kind of familiar breaks. There are others that we'll talk about quite a lot where a technology is put in. So the age of print, the machine, the telegraph, the steam, the telephone, the car. A quotation from Carlyle in the early 19th century, Thomas Carlyle, a, a strange man. Um, he, um, uh, he, he, he's known for being thoroughly unpleasant, and his wife was also known for being thoroughly unpleasant. And someone said it was a blessing from God that they were married to one another, because now two rather than four people will be miserable. Um, <laughs> but he said, sort of talking about the 19th century, making a shift in a way from the idea from, he says, it's not a heroical, devotional, philosophical, or moral age, but above all, it's a mechanical age. It's the age of machinery. And in some ways, he wants to put a bit in that it's not just a broad question of the material of production, nor is it with terms like the Renaissance or the Enlightenment, a kind of ideal, uh, idealist view of what the age is. It's all to do with machines. And it's machines that really shift our perspective. Um, 1829, anyone think of what the machines would have been around then that would make one start to say, well, it's machines that... Steam engines, Steam engines were just coming. That's right, the railway was just about to sort of break on the scene. Interchangeable parts, some would say, yeah, that we're starting to get those, absolutely. Anything else? There's a lot that we'll meet across the course of the, the, the semester, yes? Sorry? Cotton. cotton. Cotton gin. Sorry, thank you very much. And indeed, very much the things as part of um, industrial production 
uh, with the interchangeable parts and machines like the cotton gin, the jacquard loom. Jeff talked l last time very briefly about steam production of paper and the steam printing, pr the production of paper and the steam printing press. So a lot of machines coming along, people getting very excited, and Carlisle says, look, now we can typify what our age is. We're the age of machinery. There's another series of classifications that we sometimes hear of, of the classical age, the dark ages, the middle ages, the modern age. Historians often sort of type things with these. It, not, you know, I mean, in a way, IBM could have used any of these arguments. Why, any suggestions on why it didn't use that particular instance? Why did it say um, the stone, the bronze, and the iron rather than the classical, the dark, the middle, and the modern ages? Any thoughts on why it didn't use? I mean, obviously, it could have used any one of these. It could have said there was the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, and then there was IBM, clearly. Um, yes? Okay, so there's one distinction there. There's a kind of technological account rather than a social account, which would be true as well as sort of uh, ideational account of the Renaissance or the Enlightenment. So th that's one distinction, an important one, yeah. And, yes? There's also the materials are what are the tools they use to make things out of. Okay. So the, the, the sense that not only is the material, but also the tools that are driving change. And so if you're making a machine like a computer, it's going to be, yep. Yes? Right, very much so. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, sorry, what's your name? Uh, Alex. Alex, okay, Alex. That, I think, is a very good point. Can you just say a little bit more about it? Because I think you're on the right track there. Mm-hmm. Okay, so this one doesn't seem to have a technological drive. No, more social and more historical. Okay, and there's one more thing that I got close to there. Did I want to pick up on? Yeah. Um, many stone, bronze, and iron information are, 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 are uh, what the economy kind of ran on. Okay. Now, so, so something else I think I'm looking at that Alex just got to when he talked about progress. Yes. Well, that's one. That's an aspect too. But what about the question of progress? Yes. Yeah. No, it's true. But what? Anyone? Can anyone tell us in a, in a, just a nutshell, even at the sort of Wikipedia version of what were the Dark Ages? Yes. Well, indeed, and some people traditionally, I mean, less so now, but would have said, we actually kind of went backwards. That what happened kind of in the Renaissance, late Middle Ages, was that many of the ideas from classical times, and we'll talk about this when we get to science, were rediscovered, having been lost. Now, it's a very Western European view. One thing is that the Asia and China were chugging along perfectly happily and didn't go backwards. The other is the standard account that a great deal of what was lost to Europe, in fact, was held in the various Islamic countries. But for a European view, it's suddenly saying, well, history doesn't always progress, which was the word that Alex used. Sometimes it seems we go backwards. And clearly that's something IBM didn't want to say when he said we're going into the information age. I mean, there we've got little B saying, well, maybe we're not making progress at all. Here's an example where people said, actually, you can go backwards. Don't believe it's always forward motion. Um, so one question then is, if that's one way to, we need to think, keep in mind about ages, it's a question of how do we get from one age to the next? If we've got these different ages, what's going on that's going to get us between them? And I want to suggest that there's kind of three obvious sort of ways of looking at this. One is when somebody said, look, maybe there are just lots of information ages, that it's just kind of continuity. Some things change, but there's real continuity, particularly around something like information. Then there's a notion that there's evolution, and we can have a 
don't necessarily need to, if we read Stephen Jay Gould, we don't have to believe in progress and evolution, but in general, this is an idea, again, that doesn't explain the Dark Ages, because it kind of wants to say things are always getting better. Humanity is progressing. We are better than people were 100, 200, 300, 1,000 years ago. Things are better. And we tend to sort of like to believe that because it makes us comfortable. Um, yes? No, indeed. No, and indeed, as, as I said, if you read Stephen Jay Gould, he will kind of enforce that point. And indeed, in the Victorian times, I mean, there's a great contrast between Darwin, who was talking about evolution, but really didn't have a, a notion built into that that it was progress. But it was very quickly picked up by people like Herbert Spencer to argue, yeah, well, it's not only evolution, but it's progress is built into evolution. And I think when we talk about the evolution of society, implicitly we're borrowing more of that Spencerian notion than we are of Marx and trying to convince ourselves. I mean, IBM, I think, is clearly wanting to say things are getting better. Um, and I think that's not unnatural. And then the final one, which I want to spend more time on, is the question of revolution. OK, what about that? Is, it, is that what we're really looking at? Because we don't always talk just about the age of information or the information age, but about the information revolution. And that, again, is putting it in a historical context, comparing it, as I'll say, to other revolutions. So the continuity argument is really an idea that information has just been around all the time but maybe things change. So there's a phrase that you can pick up in all sorts of places where people will say, on average, an average weekday, the New York Times contains more information than any contemporary of Shakespeare's would have acquired in his lifetime. So more or less, we're all out there looking for information, but now we have more of it available. It's not that they didn't have information and we do, just they had less of it than we do. It always strikes me as an interesting phrase because they always talk about a contemporary of Shakespeare. We're not, because the implication if we put Shakespeare in there is to sort of say, well, if I read the New York Times this morning, I'm smarter than Shakespeare. And we're all a little hesitant about saying that, so we find some poor contemporary and pin it on them. But there is a sort of idea that A, there's continuity, we're all trying to do the same thing, but we've got more of it. And that can then turn into the evolutionary argument which, when we say that, you know, as we sometimes say about the computer, not since the book has such and such or such and such had a dramatic effect on, on society. Um, sorry that you, you can't. I don't know if I can get the lights down low in the front. Maybe, oh, that's exactly the wrong thing to do. And that's, oh, well, all right, me and technology, clearly. Um, is to say, well, look, books evolved. So there is a technology that's evolving, but what's making them evolve? In that story, why are books evolving? Well, yeah, so it's the technology, but what's driving the change? Or what's the explanation in this small sentence about the change? Yes? Well, yeah, but we design them why? I mean, in that sentence, what are you saying? Why? Yes? Right. But I'm, I mean, I think you're right. I'm not disagreeing with any of you. But, but I mean, just within that sentence, printed books evolved into better designed packages of information. What does that suggest? Well, that's one question. Do they, do they just evolve on their own? But also, surely, this idea, well, we must, people must have been looking for better packages of information. Because if they wouldn't, the book wouldn't have evolved. Is that not, you know, am I making too much of that? Or is the sense that information is the driving force here that is making people go out and look for technologies to say, oh, we've got so much more information, which is not unlike the story we heard earlier about Google. You know, so people said there's a whole lot of information out on the internet. Well, we better have a better search engine. And when we talk about search, we'll talk exactly about that. So there's a sense that information, in fact, you know, I would say, that information is, starts to be described as an evolutionary force pushing people to change the technology. We want information, so let's get better info technology to get there. It's not that Google gave us the information. It's that the information is out there, and Google found us a better way to organize it and get in touch with it. So in this very famous history of the, the coming of the book, 
in order to satisfy the new needs for information and education, more books and soon newspapers were required. So as humans, we have to assume, we have a kind of thirst for information and so the entrepreneurs of an age will go out and try and design new ways to get us in touch with it. And information is therefore, in some way, the evolutionary force. So in an argument in a book by Frederick Kilgore, who is uh, both a chemist and a, a, an important in the history of libraries, um, he called his book the evolution of the book. So he wanted to make an evolutionary argument. And he says, <clears throat> and these are issues that in one way or another will come to in other classes, the need for readily available information, which had been steadily rising, was accelerated by the advent of Christianity. And then a little later on, the need to find information more rapidly than is possible in a papyrus roll form book initiated the development of the Greco-Roman Codex in the second century. The Codex. Can someone tell us what the Codex is? It's a term we're going to need later on in the semester. Anyone? Anyone know what the codex is? The codex we actually referred to when we talked about strings in books. It's the bound book. That is a codex. There's a spine, the pages tied together, and you can turn the pages. And it was a huge advance in many ways on the scroll which preceded it. Well, we think of it in advance, but now when you look on the web, we seem to be going back to scrolling as a preferred form of getting through information. But that's the codex, and we're going to have to talk about that a bit. OK, back to Kilgore's argument. Any implication? So he says, look, we needed information, we as human beings. And that need grew, and so we started developing technologies to meet that need. ba -boom, the book comes along, the codex comes along. As he puts that argument there, any thoughts about it? Yes? I'm sorry, what is your name again? Uh, my name's Andrew. Andrew, OK. Um, well, I think that, you know, as the other mentioned, mm -hmm. the need for readily information that, will, that led to the book is also the same kind of need that led to our more modern, you know, the internet and people right. that you're talking about. And so it's a kind of evolutionary and continuous argument, yeah? OK. Right. So there's a kind of sense that we build up more information and then we have to order it and organize it and find it. So we devise technologies for it. Nothing terribly problematic about that. Um, and we will look at that argument over the course of the semester. Um, what about this idea that it was accelerated by the advent of Christianity? I want to pass comment on that. Yes. So, and, and that's part of Kilgore's argument, in fact. Yeah, and I think it's, uh, you know, that, that Christianity wanted to get this information out. It had a proselytizing religion. Any, any thoughts about that, though, before we pass on? Yes. Well, of course, yeah, it's always a good question about how, what, what, what we mean by read. I mean, in theory, you know, people will say well, lots of people have read it. Most printed and sold a lot. But one question, which we'll come back to later, I don't want to linger over it now, is if you're going to say that, because in fact we know historically that the Christians were the first to use the codex form widely, and we say, well, what does that say about the classical religions or the Jewish Hebrew religion, uh, or later about Islamic religion, did they not have a need for information? And so one way that we tell, tend to tell these stories is we tend to tell them about ourselves, and this is written in the West, and our own kind of world. And we suddenly make these arguments which seem plausible, but they leave a lot out. Why didn't, you know, if we've said that people in general had a need for information, and then suddenly we narrow it down to a subset of those people. What are we saying about all the other people? Do they lose their interest in information? On we'll come back to it. Um, so uh, there's an idea which we've been getting to today is, um, and this comes from Stephen Fry, who most of you will know is one of the most pompous Englishmen in the world. I'll, <laughs> I'll take second place to Fry. Um, 
He, um, he made a series for the BBC called The Machine That Made Us about the history of printing. It's an interesting one to see. It's available both on VO and on YouTube. Uh, if you have time and interest, it's actually a, a, a nice thing to look at. He says, looking at the press, it was a glittering proof that a new information age was dawning in Europe, fueled by the power of the printed word. So what's his assumption? We've been looking at people's assumptions in a way that are implicit in the way they write or talk. What's his assumption there when he says that? Yes? Well, did technology, yeah, but what's he saying about the information age there? Yes? Right. It's back to this question, which somebody brought up before. I'm sorry if I've forgotten who it was. That, you know, this is a new information age, but obviously there must have been then an old information age that was there before it. So that this stuff does take us from one age to another. But it's a kind of evolution because there were already information ages, and all we were getting, first the codex and then the printing press, which helped us a little more along with information. So that's one argument which another boring Englishman passed comment on a little earlier in another BBC program, James Burke, on printing. Now when he made his show, he gave it a very different name. He said printing transforms knowledge. And he calls it the day the universe changed. So he's having nothing to do with this stuff about evolution. And he's not saying that the scroll and then the codex were kind of signs of a continuing human interest. He's saying forget all that. Along comes this new technology and everything changes. And when we get to talk about the history of printing, and of course that's part of the assumption that people are making when they talk about this being an information age. What we can do is say this has just changed everything. And so the past kind of becomes irrelevant because we've got a whole new situation on our hands. We can look at our world and say it's fascinating. We don't have to worry about all that boring history in which case we will get rid of many of the seats in this, people in the seats in this room. Why bother? You know, it's just dull stuff in the past. So that brings us then to the question I said we'd get on to next and spend a bit of time with, and that's the revolution. So this, in many ways, is a more standard view of history's progression, is to say, look, we go through revolutions, and revolutions really change everything. Given where we are in the world, that's kind of a comforting argument. Why? Yes? Well, it does, and that's comforting. It suggests the possibility of change, absolutely, so that's a good point. But why is it one that we might be likely to listen to, I say we broadly here, but where, given where we are, we'll listen to with some kind of interest and comfort and say, yeah, exactly, that's right. Yes. That we have the power to change Yes, absolutely. I mean, it gives us that sense of power and empowerment, and that has a broader amplification given where we are. Our national narrative. Our national narrative. Thank you. Wait, tell us a little bit more about our national narrative. Right. Here we are in a country that was created by a revolution, that in many ways said we're cutting off the past. We're going to create a new world. And we want to believe that that was a good thing to do. And so it's kind of, you know, you wanted to get rid of people like me. Um, and so, you know, you, clearly you weren't entirely successful, but you had a good go at it. <laughs> but that's the sort of notion is that we can come along and create things, and it is good to do. So there's an enormous appeal in many ways to that. Um, Alvin Toffler, some of you may have heard of, he was a great futurologist who was sort of well known in the 80s, kind of disappeared for a while, but then he was taken up by Wired magazine, and so he and Newt Gingrich sort of became heroes of Wired magazine, there's a combination from hell. Um, and he came in with this idea, look, there are these waves, and in a way the waves just wash out what has gone before. So the first wave, he says, was the agrarian revolution which changed everything from what had gone before. And the next wave was the Industrial Revolution, the second wave. And that wiped everything out. And now we've got the third wave, which is the Post-Industrial Revolution. 
And as I said, as with, with Daniel Bell, that term post-industrial revolution comes more or less synonymous with the information revolution. And we start to So we just have these great big clattering revolutions. I mean, the, one of the things about the United States is on the one hand, we like to say we began with a revolution, but we're not all that keen to have another revolution. You know, we say one is enough and that's got us where we are. So they're these rather long-term things. So there's a question then, so what are we talking about when we bring this language in to talk about information, the information age? Um, what are we talking about? Because again, think back to Lil B. He's kind of saying there isn't much of a revolution around here. Um, what's the image in a revolution? Think of that word itself. What's the image? Yeah. Um, kind of a rebellion or a, uh, being against something? Well, that's if we use it politically. But if we think of the word in its non-political status. Awesome. Yeah. Well, again, we kind of impose that on it, but think back just to the word itself and its roots and where it comes from. I mean, I agree with both of you. I mean, that's how we think of it. But I want to sort of push a little against that. Yes? It's a circle. It's things that turn round a chunk. Now, why is that rather odd? Yes? Exactly. And in fact, that was a significant change. The old idea of fortune is the wheel of fortune. And the notion that people had of the wheel of fortune is kind of sometimes you're up, sometimes you're down. You know, things would come along and suddenly everything would invert. But if you waited around a while, everything would come back again. And one of the interesting things about the sort of history of revolution, qua revolution, is in, in two years ago, I have to. As a, as a side note, when, when I was looking at the evaluations of the course, somebody said at the end of it, I've heard enough about England. So you may get to feel that way. I'll, I'll try not to. But, but in this particular example, um, here, um, the, the English Revolution is kind of interesting because along they came and they looked at the king and they said, they, we don't like you in 1640. And they kicked him out. Well, they chopped his head off. Um, 20 years later, what did they do? They brought a king back. They said, oh, OK, now we want a king all over again. So they were still wandering around having those kinds of revolutions where things don't be claimed to progress, but simply to go around in circles. And we oddly still use that term, that circular term, although we tend to think, quite rightly, that no, we actually now use it to say things are changing. Anyone know what happened to that king who came back in 1660? Sorry? No, he kept his head, but uh, yeah? He was exiled. He was thrown out of the country. So they said, we don't like you. They chucked him out. And they brought another king in. And they said, now we're going to have kings who kind of have to listen to us. Because if we don't like you, we'll chuck you out again. And the intriguing thing is that's almost the first time when you start to get, in the language, this notion that revolution is not necessarily spinning in circles. And this great, great chap, John Evelyn, the diarist, wrote at the time, this is the kind of eyewitness news reporting. He was there, and he said, the Popists, that's the Catholics, and it was partly the religion they threw him out, in, in offices lay down their commissions and fly. It looks like a revolution, he said. And he was kind of right, and we borrowed that word from him. And in fact, that description doesn't look too unlike what's happening in Tunisia at the moment. Um, so then we had the, OK, so we're going to pick up on this notion of revolution. Not the first English notion, which is that circular one, but the later one that revolutions start to push us forward. Again, a kind of evolutionary progressive model. So the question then is, we have a bunch of political revolutions. Do they all look more or less the same? We, think you'd, we don't often talk about the English one. Some of you today might be the first time you've heard about it. The American one, I imagine, we've all heard of before. French, Russian, Haitian Revolution. How many people have heard of the Haitian? Can anyone give a date to the Haitian Revolution? Very important revolution. Yeah, well, it's sort of given. It's one of those ones that takes a long time. So, but 1804 is more or less thought of as, as, as the final age, when they were sort of cut loose by France and punished miserably for, their, for, the, for their, their efforts. Russian Revolution. When we're having these great visions of progressive revolution, we tend not to bring that in, because we don't kind of like that one. It's OK to kick kings out, and it's fine to kick the Brits out. 
but to bring the communists in doesn't work so well. And now we are faced, we're looking at, you know, in real time, the Tunisian revolution. And our question's about, you know, well, which way is that going, for better or for worse? Now, one thing again to remember when we want to look in the past, as I say, we're being selective. You know, we want to say, let's have an information revolution where IBM, we don't really want to talk about Russia, you know. We don't, probably don't want to talk about Haiti either, because it was a slave revolt. You know, we don't really want that. But we'll talk about the American one, and maybe the French, because they kicked a king out too. You know, had a little trouble, but later they got things right. So we tend to pick and choose, and in fact, I certainly won't go through all this, but we don't half pick and choose. Because as Alul wrote quite nicely in his book about revolution, there's an awful lot of revolutions when you look around at them. And whether we want to look at Russia, or the Sikhs, or the Mings in China, or the revolution in Japan, um, going down to Naples, going down to the Maharatas, um, there's a lot of revolutions in the world. But we tend to pick out the ones that we kind of find convenient for our story. Our question then, as we're thinking again of the information revolution, is what drives these things? This is a kind of standard bunch of explanations that come with communication revolution, social revolution. You know, what are the driving forces? We'll see these turn up all across the semester. What do those ones all have in common? Technology. Okay, so we like to think that you can often tell history this way, that it's technology that comes along and changes things. But there's some kind of intriguing counter-arguments to that. You know, there's the notion that once people got gunpowder, you know, bullets, the world changed. But one thing is, you know, what are these forces? Jared Diamond, like, has his book, you know, Guns, Germs, and Steel. You can really put your eye on the things that change the world. You can identify them. But if you look at England, France, the US, or Russia, can we instantly say there's a technology involved in any of those? I mean, these are big revolutions. Anyone think of what the great technological breakthrough of 1776 was? Yeah, but they've been shooting each other for a while. Yeah, I mean, they began. You're right. You're right. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's a question. In fact, that's an interesting question here, because we say, yeah, you know, the nature of wars changes, and that shifts power dramatically. There was an inter interesting discovery. This very dull bit of English history, the Battle of Bosworth. The only reason you might have heard it. Has anyone heard of the Battle of Bosworth Field? Yeah? Yes? <laughs> if you've read your Shakespeare, it comes into Richard III, the Battle of Bosworth. Um, but the interesting thing about the Battle of Bosworth, it's always shown in these pictures of people with shields and swords coming down on each other. And it's just another boring battle in a line of boring battles. But only about two years ago, they were excavating the site. And they discovered first, a little embarrassing for the historians, that they'd found the wrong, they'd been looking at the wrong site for the all of you know, the last 200 years of the big site. This is the Battle of Bosworth. They were in the wrong place. Then when they went over to the right place and looked at it, and were digging up, they found bullets in the field. And nobody had ever known that there were bullets in England at that time or at the Battle of Bosworth. So why is that kind of a revealing discovery? Would we just shrug, shrug and move on? Why would that be revealing? Embarrassing in some ways. Yeah, how? Well, it made the assumption that there were guns to go with it. Unless I hadn't thought of that. Right? They were throwing them at each other. <laughs> but, I mean, more to the point is that we tend to like to say, again, you know, when a new technology like the gun comes along, it changes everything. The world changes. Yet nobody had thought of this as a battle that changed anything. It was just another boring battle with people trying to take the heads off kings. Um, so we tend to think, well, you know, if that technology came along, it changed things. The interesting thing about this find is it says, well, maybe it doesn't. Uh, and then if we look at our history, you know, <coughs> of dates, and as we said last week, you know, there are long periods where no technologies really turn up at all. And they're often the bits that histories of communication and the like will just skip over. You know, we go from the printing press to the telegraph because nothing happens in between. If you ask what's up, 
The answer is not much. You know, bah. <laughs> boring as hell. And this class, once again, is a feat of boredom, is going to concentrate on those periods. In part because if you look at all those dates of the revolutions that I've just talked about, they all fall in those particularly broad, boring periods where nothing much happens. So again, our tendency to see, you know, there's writing, and then there's the codex, and then there's print, and then there's the telegraph, but all sorts of other things were going on without any great technological change. And as Bosworth suggests, there were occasionally major technological changes which don't seem to have had any impact at all. But again, to come back to the sort of revolution and say, well, okay, well, that's kind of the standard boring story of political and maybe technological revolution. But maybe we're on to something new. And what is that newness? Well, that actually we've got a revolutionary kind of revolution. Those old revolutions were sort of the just typical stuff of boring history books. But now the world now taking shape is not only new, but new in entirely new ways. It's the new new. It's not just new, but a new new. So we can say all those arguments or hesitations kind of don't count anymore because something really different is happening. And indeed, you see that again, you know, like the IBM ad, all over our ways of describing what's going on, sort of, at least in my lifetime and before and during your lifetime. This is the CEO of AT&T in 1999. The telecom revolution, he wants to say, has begun. And he wants to say that because then he can say, I'm in charge of the revolution. I run AT&T. And maybe the first in history to have no losers. So there are all those boring revolutions before, but I've come along. And even though my service in San Francisco in 2011 will be dreadful, I'm going to say that the world has changed in ways that nobody has ever appreciated before. And the great thing about it is there are going to be no losers. Or, indeed, you can get John Markov writing in the, in the New York Times, idealists hope that the computer revolution, OK, so it's not the telephone, but AT&T can still hang in there, wouldn't be like the Industrial Revolution. This time, wealth, information would be free to everybody, and instant communication would break down the barriers between the rich and the poor. So unlike all those other revolutions, we're really going to do the thing. Well, I would certainly bring as witness to this feast my old mate Lil B, because <laughs> he's having none of that. Are we having any of that? I mean, is it a revolution that brought, brought down the barriers between rich and poor? Yes? Well, the fact that Lil B can, can uh, you know, say his side of the story is revolutionary. Right. I mean, he's pretty U YouTube savvy, old Lil B, and he knows how to work a synthesizer, too. So we assume <laughs> that, that he's, he's OK. So maybe he's wrong. Yes? Are you going to say? OK, so I mean, maybe it's, maybe it's just all out there, but that doesn't mean we all have equal yeah, opportunity to use it. Yeah? Fair. Yeah? Well, I wouldn't necessarily say it breaks down barriers, but it allows transparency. Right, so this is the point over here that, that, that YouTube, you know, he, he's savvy on YouTube, and that's a sign of something. So maybe the, he's, he's broken. Yeah? And, and there's a point that I let me sort of elaborate on, on that point. When, um, when sort of libraries started to go digital and then universities started to put more and more podcasts and the like online, so somebody once wrote, well, you know, now everyone, we'll, we'll get to this later, everyone's going to have access to the world's universities. So we're kind of all equal in the world of education. The old school tie doesn't matter anymore. We're just going to have. Now, that's an intriguing thing to say. What? kind of effect does that have on the way we think about the people who therefore aren't tapping into the digital library and going out and getting entrepreneurial jobs? Yeah? I 
So there's a question. I mean, are, we, are things actually widening? But one thing I was going to say is that if we just say, well, look, information is just going to make the table level, then it tends to mean, well, that everybody, therefore, who's homeless, who's fallen behind or poor, well, that's their fault. Because information is just out there, and you could get it if you wanted. Now, we have to be a little cautious when we say that. Yes? Okay, so there is, there is a notion out there then that really it's their responsibility because the things are available. A lot of policies are very educated. Yeah, right. So so this is this is our argument. Okay, well, okay, that's one that's out there, and therefore the sense of well, maybe this is a political revolution. Um, okay, so let the, we'll come back to a lot of these as we go on. Let me sort of now bring it to the revolution, perhaps that you're engaged in, um, and that is the notion of intergenerational revolution. The idea that one generation is just entirely cut off for another, that you live in a different world. Well, we can begin by saying that the notion of the generation gap seems to have been traced to the difference between mothers and daughters wearing lipstick. But if we leave that aside, um, there is this idea that the computer has suddenly made generation different, that there is, and Jeff mentioned this the other day, digital natives. And so there are books like Born Digital. The book that was kind of written for my generation was called Being Digital, kind of saying you could become that way, but for you guys it's Born Digital. You just didn't have the option, but hell, you're out there ahead of us. So this is, I think, one of the earliest sort of comments on it, the encountering the digital age, which saying, you know, well, maybe back in 1993, so maybe you didn't quite make the cuts. Um, the, you know, the, the, this, is, this is when the savvy generation picked up. Digital natives now has become a current term. Most of you will have heard it. Today's students think and process information fundamentally differently. All right, that's you guys. Um, and uh, these differences run much deeper than most educators, that's me, would have it. Okay, so there's really no reason for you to come and sit in front of me because you know, you, you know where it's at. Um, and there is this idea that this is kind of utterly, utterly new that the accelerating pace of change has made your world a different world, a world that I can't really speak to because I never lived through it. I can study it. I can think about it. But I wasn't there. Um, <clears throat> but then there's a question, well, hang on. Are you getting left behind? Because college students scratch their heads at what their high school siblings are doing, and they scratch their heads at their younger siblings. It's sped up generational difference. So now we have a notion that we're all just flinging apart one after the other. And if you were Generation M1, you know, Generation M2 is coming along to say, no, we're the real digital generation. That five years ago, young people spent an average of nearly six and a half hours a day with media and managed to pack more than eight and a half hours worth of media content at that time. At that point, it seemed that young people's lives were filled to the bursting point. Today, those levels have been shattered. So you can look at me and say, you're a piker, old man. But I can look at you and say, you're pikers, too, because the next lot are coming along are really that much better than you. So we're now into a series, not where, gener where revolutions happen once every 500 years, but seem to happen once every five years. Do you buy that? That you guys are left on the, left on the shore? No? So these differences that we're sort of starting to project, well, how big are they? It's a question, and it's one that we want to bring up in, in, in the course again about this nature of what is the information age, who is the informational generation, and what's it doing to us to be part of that revolution. A series of books that came out in the last couple of years, uh, one, one that you can all sort of go out and tear up and burn, it says that you are the dumbest generation. So it's making a little bit of a little B argument, saying, look, you guys know nothing, because you spend your whole time texting. Um, you get the one in the middle, the powers on Hamlet's, Hamlet's Blackberry, that says, you know, how can we? What's, it's not so much that you just sit there tweeting, sitting in the bath with a beer by your side and forget about the rest of the world. It's actually in a way that you're just being overwhelmed by technology. And it's impossible for you to know all these things. Or there's a third one, which is Nicholas Carr's argument, that actually this stuff is eating at your brain. 
And so he has a technological argument which kind of goes with every new technology. The argument we've seen today, you know, things go better and better and better and better and better. And whoomph, along come you guys and you just go down into the... You know. Actually, it's kind of different because he says you're in the shallows, not the deeps. But let's put it on a hill and a cliff, just to say. Um, quick, quick, quick issues on that one. Are we going to accept that? Anything in that worth listening to? Should you worry about what this stuff is doing to your brain? Is it just making you smarter? Is it just making you dumber? Is it putting you in a great deal of anxiety? Because these are obviously different views. Even if we accept the notion of revolution, they're very different views of what the revolution is doing. One is it's beneficial, you know, that we've been looking at. Now people are starting to say, well, it's fraught with anxiety. One is it's just ruining your brains, turning into mush. And the other is you yourselves, a little like we said about the poor and the homeless, it's your fault. Live with it. Yes? Ah, they're just jealous. That's right. Because they really. So, so what you would then say that actually things are just are really getting better? So it's not as bad as that, but it may be. Uh -huh. What, that you're dark? Uh, no, sorry. Uh, w w what's not? <laughs> what's not that you're like? W w what's the it's not that? What's the problem that you're saying is not due to tweeting? So. Well, I mean, to say that like, things are getting worse because we have no more serious technology. Mm -hmm. So things might be getting worse. I mean, that's why I'm trying to tease out here. Which, which direction are we going? We go back to our early questions. Where, where, where are we going? Back, forward or back? Yes. OK, so maybe it's a much more nuanced picture. And it's a tricky picture, because maybe there's benefits here, and there's deficits there. Or we're abandoning some things because we want to spend more time with other things. It's a much more, I mean, what, what people love to do when they write these books, in part because they want to be able to go on news shows and be able to give the plot in two and a half seconds, is tell a story that's very, very simple. So if you come along and say, well, it's a little more complex than that, they really don't want to hear. They either want to hear you saying, it's a disaster, or it's tremendous. But there's a kind of voice out here, yes? Yeah, kind of going back to that point, I think uh, what these people are ignoring are like a lot of the benefits of technology, like how it, how it improves the way we learn and uh, like intelligence. Well, some people think that's a curse beyond all curses, yeah. but I, 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 I sort that's of know with you. Okay. Um, so, OK, so that there's a lot of nuanced questions then. Instead of these very simple narratives, which somehow in the past we accepted, you know, well, a revolution came along and changed everything. A new technology came along and changed everything. But now that it's our lives, or maybe I should say your lives that are at stake, and maybe the difference not only between you and me, but you and your younger siblings, you want to say, well, hang on, maybe it's a little more complex. Maybe some things have improved and others haven't. And maybe this is beneficial. Or maybe the past wasn't quite like that, and therefore the present can't be compared to it. All sorts of complex questions which will come up across the semester. And brings me then, as we're rushing towards the end, to the final point. And that's one reason, he said, selling the course furiously, to study history. Because how can we answer those questions? Are we getting better? Are we getting worse? How do we know if we don't know what the past was like and what people were up to? There's a, uh, a poem by a little often maligned poet, Rudyard Kipling, um, a guy who, who was born in India and shipped back to England about the age of eight and loathed the place ever since. Uh, but he was able to say, what do they know of England? Because there are lots of people in England saying, England's the best place in the world. We're the greatest. We're, we're, we're wonderful. He said, what do they know of England who only England know? So what can we say about our age or our generation or our historical zeitgeist if that's all we know? How can we say it's an improvement or better or advancing unless we actually have a little look at what goes on behind? And that's difficult because as the novelist L.P. Hartley wrote, the past, he said, is another country. They do things differently there. And trying to understand that province takes a lot of work, because otherwise we're going to look back and just say, oh, it's very easy to compare them with ourselves. They were dumb, and we're smart. Yeah. Or you do the reverse and say, they had a wonderful life, and ours is miserable and full of complexities. If we really want to ask any of these questions about the information age, 
we have to be prepared to say, how can we really understand that? And the one nice thing that George Young said when looking back at the past, he said, look, the central theme of history is not what happened to people, but what people felt about it when that was happening. And that's one of the things we want to try and catch in the course. So one of the things we'll be doing quite a lot of is looking at people, these people you'll meet in their readings, Plato, Tritamius, Spratt, Samuel Johnson, Morse, who invented the telegraph, Babbage, who invented a computer, Bell and the telephone. We want to know what they were thinking. And we'll be reading their original works to try to see if we can understand how the world looked to them so that when we make those comparisons, or when we use them to say, not since the invention of printing, we'll have a better idea of what they thought before we start making these grand claims about everything getting better or everything getting marginally worse. So that's really the, um, the, the, the where we're going. Um, just to go back to you know, our ideas that tri technology is triumphant and we're dealing with the triumph of technology, uh, the BBC uh, a few years ago put out a quiz saying what were the, um, the most important or most significant um, technological innovations since 1800. Um, if you look at a list from somewhere like Wired, uh, you will see, you know, Wired would put it all in fairly modern technologies and say, so the BBC had a vote to say what was the most important technology since 1800. Any guesses? I guess what that is. The what? The pin? Pill. pill. The pill. Well, it's an interesting issue, and the pill actually features fairly highly in it, uh, in, in the quiz. And this was a popular, this is just everybody put out to vote. Any other? Yeah, the pill was one. Yeah. Sorry? Microwaves, an interesting idea, changing the house. I think that comes into the final list as well. Yes? Television. Television. Sounds like a good list. It actually is a technology we've met already today. Yes? Well done. Well done. So. The first one was the bicycle. By quite a long distance, it knocked everything in. Well, you can say again, those are the Brits. You know, fair enough. But, um, uh, but, but that's you know, just worth thinking about. How do, when you really do have to sit down and say, what are the things that have changed society? Uh, there's another BBC program that's actually up at the moment that you can find worth looking at called The History of the World in 100 Objects. The objects of the sort of 90, the 20th century are an intriguing collection of objects. Um, OK, so uh, that's, that's the topic today. The only thing I have left to do, therefore, is to talk a little bit about the reading and the assignment. The reading, which is up on the site, there are two articles. One is by Robert Heilbronner, and that's available through the California Digital Library. So there's a link up there to get you to it. The other is by Raymond Williams, and that is in the reader, okay? So about the fourth article into the reader. And the assignment, which is due in on Sunday, says that, and we'll, we'll post this assignment up there as well, is that in his article, on page 11 and 12 of his article, Williams is talking about, the, both of them are talking about the question of technological determinism. Heilbronner says, look, I'm a historian, and you have to be able to acknowledge that machines change history. That's where we began. And Williams says, no, I'm not. I'm really, it was a, English teacher, uh, English professor, but also a sociologist. And he said, no, when you look at these things in detail, it's very difficult to say machines change history. Now, he uses the argument of television. So I'm asking you to read both those articles where Williams gives nine examples of how we can think of television changing society. Say, well, what would happen if you put the internet there? Because he says those arguments don't hold up. However you try to argue that technology changes society and history, he says, no, those arguments don't hold up. So I want you to look at those arguments, read William's article, ask yourself, has anything changed because we have the internet rather than television? And therefore, way, is Williams wrong? And is Heilbronner right? Or is Heilbronner right, saying, yeah, machines do change history, and therefore, is Williams wrong? Sorry, you had a question. What's our length? 250 words. So 250 words max. Don't go over that. Don't go off into a huge length, but try to make a concise argument that allows us to think, do machines change history or not? Is it Heilbronner right or is Williams right? Yes? Uh, the first article is online. You link to from the site. The second article is in the reader.
Okay? Any other questions? All right, so see you on Tuesday.